So, and it's, it's just a delight um, to be doing this presentation for you folks. Um, the um, line I've, uh, that the title for this presentation comes from the quote from Wayne Gretzky that you hear over and over again, which is that Gretzky said at one point um, that he didn't skate to where the puck was, he was skating to where the puck was going to go. So that's really what you have to do because, um, you know, when I think about it, we don't really have a health human resource policy um, in Ontario or in Canada. Uh, and so that you're really sort of trying to skate wherever it might be going, you know, that, that we, we, we do have this kind of strange um, situation in Canada where we decide we're gonna train some kind of health personnel and, and it turns out that there's no jobs for them. In fact, of course, that's what happened with the nurse practitioner program at McMaster that I remember back in the 1970s. So, um, so that you folks have, a, have a, you, it's like you have to play four-dimensional chess. You have to know um, what's going on everywhere, and then you still are somewhat vague in whether or not you can achieve your goals. So um, um, that's why um, I talk about things and you have to do them, because talking about them is a lot easier than doing them. So here's my version of, of the story, and, and this is the outline of my presentation for you today that healthcare costs are not wildly out of control. Aging of the population won't break the bank, but money isn't the most important issue. There are affordable solutions to all of the apparently intractable problems in our health system, if you will. Um, Tommy Douglas' second stage of Medicare, um, or as I'll outline shortly, um, I think that's synonymous what you, with what you may have heard in the last few years, the so-called quality agenda in healthcare. So what we need an adult conversation about is how we spread these proven innovations. And then finally, so out of all of this analysis, I'll give you what's gonna be the role of post-secondary institutions. So let's talk about the sustainability of Medicare. Um, and this is Canadian healthcare costs as a share of our gross domestic product, our GDP, our overall economy. Um, and economists, when looking at healthcare costs within a jurisdiction over time, or between jurisdictions typically use this as the metric. And that's because if you're talking about affordability and the language of the sustainability is all about, you know, we can't afford it, then of course, what, do, what defines sustainability of any one item in your expenditures, like your rent or your transportation? It's what percentage of your income that that, that item takes and whether it is growing over time. That we don't control the cost of the non-Medicare spending very well. Medicare spending, uh, the services covered by the Canada Health Act, as you probably know, are just physicians and hospital services. And physicians and hospital services, this is absolute spending in current dollars, not a control for inflation. So as you can see, hospital spending and especially physician spending really have not risen that dramatically. They've risen be compared to other things, but they haven't risen nearly dramatically as other healthcare spending. And when we look at other healthcare spending, the one that's really out of control is the drugs budget. And, um, and in fact, um, in Canada, we, uh, our per capita spending on drugs is, almost, is getting close to being what the Americans is. It's the second highest in the world. So now let's take a look at provincial health, breaking it down provincially. And in this case, we've got, the situation does not look as good in Ontario as it does in other provinces. Ontario in this graph is in purple, and um, we're cruising along sort of lower than the Canadian average um, until um, just recently, and now we're actually spending more than the Canadian provincial average, or now we're actually back down to more or less the, the, the Canadian average. Um, other provinces do better than we do, but what's particularly interesting to me is it doesn't matter where I go in the country. I mean, Alberta, has no affordability problem with its health care, zero. I mean, Alberta is one of the w wealthiest jurisdictions in the whole world. If Alberta were a country, the amount it spends on health care as a share of its GDP would be the lowest in the world. So, um, but it doesn't matter where you are, the rhetoric is the same. And this is the, those graphs that I put up earlier for Ontario, and as you can see, that, on, that, that health care has risen faster as a share of our GDP, Part of that is it reflects the declining economic situation of Ontario vis-a-vis -vis 
the western provinces, and, um, and, and that is due to the declining of manufacturing everywhere in North America compared to those places that, are, that, ha that have good resources, especially fossil fuels. Healthcare costs are not wildly out of control. Next, myth, aging the population won't kill Medicare either. Canada's population is aging, healthcare costs do increase with age, but aging of the population per se has had and will have only a moderate impact on health expenditures. And when you think about it, of course, aging, it's not a tsunami. You know, we keep on talking, referring to silver tsunami. You've seen tsunamis, right? They roll in, they're going like, you know, 60, 80, 100 kilometers an hour, and they roll over anything in its path. Have you ever seen anybody knocked over by a glacier? Have you ever seen that? Uh, come on, right? Even when glaciers were growing, they're only growing a few meters a year. I mean, it, you can't get knocked over by a glacier unless you don't move for a decade or more. So um, we have lots of time to prepare and adapt our system. And the elder, elderly are healthier than ever, which should be a comfort to us. And high-performing health systems can definitely hold costs. It all goes back to Tommy Douglas. Many people uh, uh, wrongly ascribe to Douglas the problems in our system say that you know, a doddering old man who meant well, perhaps, but bequeathed the system doesn't work very well. Well, in fact, the good things about Medicare, the fact that it's dramatically lower costs of administration, um, and, and the fact that we have much better equity than the US has in their system, those things are when we listen to Douglas. The problems we have in our system are due to the fact that we stopped listening to Douglas at a crucial point when he was talking about how to move to the second stage of Medicare. So he says, you know, the first part of Medicare, he says, was easy, just removing the financial barriers. Douglas talked all his life about how we had to go beyond public payment, and we needed to move to the next phase, which he referred to as to altering our delivery system to reduce costs and put an emphasis on preventive medicine. And that's what we're talking about today, changing the way we deliver services. Now, this is what I refer to as Tommy Douglas's the second stage of Medicare, and I like to tell it as a story because I, I think I find it very comforting to most Canadians for whom Tommy Douglas remains a hero. And it, it helps to explain, number one, that his original vision was right. We should be celebrating his original vision, and there was nothing wrong with it. We just didn't follow through. So what's wrong with Medicare has nothing to do with the fact that it's publicly financed. It has nothing to do with the fact that most services are delivered by not-for-profit entities. It has everything to do with the fact that we did not adopt Tommy Douglas's second stage of Medicare. But really, when I think about the second stage of Medicare, it really reminds me a lot of the so-called quality agenda that people have been hearing about in Canada and especially in Ontario over the last 10 years. So, and this is the quality agenda. Um, that healthcare has a big quality problem. We don't talk about it much. Um, Canada's hospital care may be as good or bad as anyone else's, but our primary health care and community services lag behind other countries. And that's why our system underperforms more than anything, because you know it, it's like pulling your goalie in the first period. You'll score lots of goals. Your offense will be aided by having a sixth skater on the ice, but you'll lose every single game because the opposition will score so many goals against you. Well, that's what we've done. Primary health care is the backstop to our system. When you don't have adequate primary health care, it, has, it doesn't matter how good your hospital system is. It is never going to make up for the fact that there's so many people in hospital who didn't need to be there. Improving quality is really hard and requires leadership and resources. And health care boards have very important roles. And quality is really important for sustainability. Lots of examples of where you know, better aftercare from hospital discharge will dramatically reduce rates of readmission. Um, just better management to pain control. We do pain control terribly in Canada. We either inadequately treat pain or we give, you know, people enough Oxycontin they can kill themselves, as, um, as what's his name, Ripien did last month and as we may find Wade Belak did, the um, NHL enforcer who died yesterday. Um, and um, in, in Ontario, in 2003, when we were telling seniors we didn't have any money for home care, um, we were spending in Ontario $65 million a year through the Ontario Drug Benefit Plan for Vioxx, a drug that no one should have been taking. In BC, where they made Vioxx harder to get, 
They save $23 million a year and no doubt dozens of lives. These are the attributes of the high performing health systems from the Ontario Health Quality Council. This, the, it, the, the, in, the initial vision was that this would be lay out the goals, objectives, et cetera, for the overall system, that all organizations would report on these nine and their contribution to fulfilling each of these goals, and then it would all cascade up. This didn't happen initially, but it looks like it's now slowly starting to happen. Most Canadians' values are how the world should work. Most Canadians strongly value Medicare, but whose values count? And of course, um, uh, Canadians and Ontarians are very afraid of not being able to get acute care. They're troubled by not being able to get community care and primary health care, but they do not appreciate how important those areas are as a fulcrum for the whole system. Beliefs, how does the world work? Doctors and nurses know what to do, we just need more of them. Community care and primary health care are frills. Or to quote somebody from the ministry regarding why you know, aging, and, aging at home sort of became aging anywhere but in the hospital, your stuff didn't work so we put the money into hospitals. Interest, how does the work, world work for me? Ontario is a non-integrated system. System reforms are strongly skewed by interest groups, in particular organized medicine. Look at these other groups, the pharmaceutical industry. How powerful are they? Other professionals, you know, you don't want Doris Grinspan on your case, right? Um, and what about the healthcare unions in this province? Another significant group. The OMA, again, is by far the strongest, but these are all tough, strong provincial organizations that no premier really wants to go up against. And we have a real problem that we are not talking about in Ontario, hardly at all, which is we have no policies to ensure that the workers go to where they're needed. Um, we've got a real problem in Canada because we don't have a country. where th There's only about 17 countries in the world that are federations. There's no other country in the world where the federal government spends less than 50% of the public sector's money. In Canada, it's at 40%. And in another couple of years, God knows it could be down to 30%. We've got at the provincial level, we have no health goals. Quebec has had some health goals of some sort for 25 years. Um, we have no provincial health plan. There's no official ministry strategic plan. Interestingly enough, the 2006 legislation that set up the LINS requires the ministry to have a strategic plan. There was one developed in draft form. You could sort of measure yourself as what kind of an insider you were as to which version of the draft report that you could, the draft strategic plan you could see. Many provincial policy directions, including on chronic disease management, only achieve draft form, not officially available. Um, in the UK, they've got things called service frameworks that lay out, you know, what should service look like for the aged, for people with diabetes, et cetera. We've only got a few. The stroke strategy actually is a real accomplishment in Ontario. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but by and large, we don't have that kind of direction either. The Ministry of Health priorities given to the LINs are mainly about acute care. They're coming annually in a letter because the ministry never developed their strategic plan. The legislation that requires them to produce a strategic plan doesn't actually say when it has to be developed or who it's to be released to, so it didn't mean anything. Um, and there's little, over, there's little social policy coordination in this province. In fact, um, we even have three separate ministries that fund public health services in this province. And, um, and again, compared to Quebec, which is the best example in, in, in Canada, we really don't coordinate social policy. So, you know, the social assistance reform is not synced at all, really, with our health policy reforms, et cetera. In Quebec, um, high school dropouts are a big issue for all of government, and it's a major priority for the whole health and social services system. The LINs have, appear to have little real authority to integrate services. They're really a way station. Are we going to get a regional health authority model? Are we going to disestablish other hospital, other boards? Are we rather going to go to more a coordination body at a regional level, but then get more meaningful boards at a community level? Quebec has 95 local health and social services boards in Ontario that amount to about 150 boards. That would probably make more sense and then to have some sort of regional coordination mechanism. But the LINs as they are, are just a setup to take flack because they don't actually do much. There's been, there's almost no part of their budget that is flexible. They haven't been able to integrate services and bring in new, real new innovations. Um, and um, 
and, 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 and they, they haven't supplanted any other boards. So they're really just another layer of management. They're completely vulnerable for being that. The big problem is that there's little provincial direction on anything. Who, who should you be training, right? Um, the McMaster thought they should be training nurse practitioners in the 1970s, and then they had to give up the program. And yet, it's, the evidence is even more compelling now that nurse practitioners should be implemented, and they're still struggling. And doctors, you know, um, adding insult to injury in Ontario, have managed to uh, push through the physician assistant program. And again, you know, okay, if we had physician's assistants like they had in the U.S., because they've got all these thousands and thousands of medics that come out of the armed services every year, and that's why the U.S. developed their physician assistant program, to deal with the medics that were trained for Vietnam. Well, in Canada, we don't have the same issue. Why do we have PAs? It's because the doctors wanted a maid. They did not want an equal. They wanted somebody they could order around. So that makes no sense from HHR planning. I know a number of people in community health centers said, we don't even want PAs. You know, that, that we wanted independent practitioners, which NPs are and PAs are not. You have to, tr so, but, so how do you train the right students? How do you know who the right students are? Train, and, and really, we need to train students to cope with today, with the stupid stuff of today, but to relentlessly pursue tomorrow. So who are the right students? Well, this is just, you know, as I looked at your faculty and thought about this, you know, primary healthcare nurses. So these are NPs as well as RNs working in primary health care practices. There are very few of them now compared to the numbers we should have. And, and, the, the, and, and the, the inter it, when I look at a number of practices, you know, like five, six doctors, one NP, one or two RNs, that's stupid. I mean, you should probably have like two doctors, five NPs, and 10 RNs, right? That, and, and, and 20 community health workers. So, um, that we've done very little thinking about what is the right um, um, uh, uh, components for a primary health care team. But we should feel okay about this. At Group Health Cooperative Puget Sound in Seattle, the, at, at, at Kaiser Permanente, even in the UK system, they have not really thought very much about this, which is interesting because it's all just dictated by the way we've always done things and the culture which gives physicians the authority to decide what the work processes are. We need peer counselors. We need self-management support. And um, I think we also need to look at the medical assistance of the future. The current receptionists in medical, most medical offices do not have the right training. They don't, that, that, that receptionists are, are after physicians, the key people to deal with when it comes to implementing advanced access and other um, queue management systems. Um, they have to know this. They have to be much more fluent with the use of information management. So we need to somehow prepare students to, um, to, to, to look at, to know what the system should look like, but to be able to cope somehow with the way it is now. Um, and I'm gonna, I've just put this into your package because I, they're my 10 commandments. They're from the seminal report from 2001 from the US Institute of Medicine crossing the quality chasm. And they're just very sensible rules of how to, um, how to improve the health system. And re-engineering the workforce for quality. We've got to learn about quality improvement. Uh, how many of you um, are, have been trained to do rapid cycle process improvement? This is something you've got to learn. So the plan, do, study, act cycles. This is something that everybody is going to have to know. Are you learning, I assume, in nursing, are you taking something about critical appraisal now? Yeah. Well, 20 years ago, you, there weren't programs in nursing. I mean, 30 years ago at McMaster, when it was being developed there and at Yale and a few other places around the world, um, it was originally seen as, okay, this is what you need to know if you're going to research. And then at McMaster, it was introduced for all internal medicine residents. And now, and, and at Mac in the 90s, it got to the undergraduate level. We appreciate now that every undergraduate health professional needs to learn about how to critically appraise the medical literature. I think that we're just at that point now for quality. Um, and here's another need for education that maybe you folks could be thinking of getting involved with. There's a massive learning curve that boards have to climb. There are a number of initiatives across the country to train boards, but really there isn't, any, there isn't anything local. We need local stuff. And there, you know, in this area, particularly coming from the prairies, I mean, 
Durham County's got over 600,000 people. There's probably going to be 800,000 people here in another 10 to 20 years. This is a huge number of people. There's all these boards that need help climbing this, this, uh, this steep incline. So what role do post-secondary institutions have in trying to educate boards? And here's some final thoughts. Be the useful engine. Lake Ridge's health strategic plan seems written for you. I mean, I took a quick look at it. It's all about integration of care, interprofessional care. Um, align yourself with the quality agenda. I think that's, I've, I've recommended that for many years. The OHA last year aligned itself with the Ontario Health Quality Council framework. More and more, I think it's going to be the metric. I mean, I think it's kind of silly that the ministry has not given better direction to hospitals as they develop their quality improvement plans to follow those nine attributes of a high-performing health system, but I think it's going to be coming. And um, I really wanted to mention this to your president, actually, but I don't, I don't know if any of you, how many of you have heard of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI? A few of you. Well, it is, you, those folks will know it is the preeminent organization in the world with uh, championing the quality agenda. It was founded by Dr. Donald Berwick, a Boston pediatrician, who a year ago became the head of the U.S. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, with with a budget of $700 billion. Um, and uh, Berwick has been knighted by the Queen for his work in the UK, where they've really taken this on. He's been an advisor to the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. And IHI has a wonderful open school that they offer, and, and it's, it's interdisciplinary. The U of T school, which I'm a faculty advisor to, now involves 500 students from eight faculties. It's uh, for the question about how do you get students together, it's the natural thing to do, and, and plus they've got curriculum online already. So I'd strongly recommend, this is, this is a recommendation I think you should think about right away, getting um, an open school, an IHI open school chapter here. And I know that you have arrangements with Queens, but I, I don't know what the latest is on York's, York University's medical school. It, it, it's probably coming along at some point. It's not too early to talk to them and, and um, that they would seem to be a much more natural partner than Queens for the work that you want to do. And York has really been set up. One of the focuses that's supposed to be on community care, um, working in, in rural and suburban areas, they're supposed to be doing everything that U of T isn't doing. U of T is so relieved that they can really just focus on the minutiae, which they'd like to focus on anyways. So in summary, um, Healthcare costs are not out of control. The aging population won't break the bank. Medicare was and is good public policy, but we developed problems because we didn't follow Tommy Douglas's original vision. There are affordable solutions to all Medicare's apparently intractable problems. We have to chart new ways to make policy that integrate key evidence and bread best practices. And post-secondary institutions like yours have a really major role in redesigning our system for quality. So I'll close with one more quote from Mr. Douglas. Um, that all of you must believe. Courage, my friends, is not too late to make a better world a favorite quote of Jack Layton's as well, my favorite quote.